You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your hosts, Josh Furlong and Robert Jackson. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I'm Josh Furlong, joined today again with Robert Jackson, one of my co-hosts. We also have with us today wide receiver from the University of Utah, Solomon Enos. How's it going, Solo? It is going good. Glad to be back for another week on the podcast. That's right. We got to do this. Now, I'm glad to have you back. Before we jump into the most important stuff, obviously being football, so I had lunch today from the Chicken Shack, okay? This is no sponsor. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw this in there or anything. They're, they're more than welcome to sponsor us if they want to. But So I went to the Chicken Shack on 4 South, okay? So it's right by the University of Utah. And uh, I was curious, are you a wings guy or a chicken tenders guy? Or are you both, neither? What, what, what's going on? Oh, that's easy. Well, first off, Chicken Shack, you heard the man himself. If we can make it happen, let's make it happen. Sponsor but, that uh, guy. No, Sponsor I'm, Solo. Yeah. I'm definitely <laughs> a wings guy, 100%. You're not even going oh, tenders. Boy. No tenders, huh? I mean, I could do chicken tenders, but I like think I think I can go with wings a little bit more. Um, I can add on to this question. Let me ask y'all this. So we're talking about wings. Are you a drum or or flat kind of guy? Oh, that, that, <sighs> I'm a traditionalist. So like uh, my my kids wanted pizza. So what do I do? I order wings because that's what I want, right? <laughs> Dip them in the ranch. Like what? I mean, you can't go wrong. A little barbecue you don't do both? sauce. Uh, I mean, if if they're presented in front of me, but if I could order them, I'll probably order the drum. You know, if if I if I got a pick, I'm I'm gonna eat anything that you put in front of me. So I'll eat either, um, honestly. So we got drum. I'm going flats. See, I'll, I I do like really? the flats, but I do like the drums as well. So I don't. I'm I'm gonna be the the heresy here guy, and I'm gonna say the chicken tenders went out for me though. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> look, I'm not I'm not oh. like saying you know chicken wings. Know. The are... conservative, humble answer from Josh for long. <laughs> the the <laughs> terrible answer from Josh, right? Chicken Shack sponsor Josh for long for the podcast. <laughs> no, they're not gonna sponsor us now. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> No, but no, I mean, like, I'll eat it. Ask, why, the, why the tenders? Is it, is it yeah. the sauce? Is it you don't have the debona? Yeah, are you, you the know, breading is it or out? like what is yeah. it? See, I, for me, it's I don't have to deal with the bones. Just dump it in the sauce. Just go away with it and eat. And, you know, I'm not afraid to get my hands messy. I love to do that. But if if you're gonna give me both, if I don't have to be messy, see, I'm kind of a weirdo where like I don't like stuff on my hands, and so like I think that's probably why I go. But I I do love the chicken wings. I'm not gonna turn them away by any means. So that turns you into hungry. a boneless guy, too. <clears throat> What's that? You're more of a boneless guy then, huh? You go to Wingstop, you're ordering boneless, not mm, bone-in. Pro- probably. I mean, I, I yeah. Well, well, I'm just going to say yeah. We'll just say it. I, I guess we're yeah, really the only I, team. I like, to, I like to know what I'm eating, right? Like, I don't know what this is. Like, it's some mishmash of chicken parts that you've glued <laughs> together to make tenders. I don't know what you're doing over here. Like, we're, give me the wing. It, it's original. We're not making the uh, McRib right here, right? sauce. Yeah. Oh man! Oh, the McRib. <laughs> uh, oh, don't say that. We're man. trying to get a McDonald's sponsor, all right? Okay. <laughs> Wait, hey, look. Any food that wants to sponsor us, I'm all in. I I'll eat anything. So, well, within reason. So, we're gonna have to make this into a food tasting show. We're not even gonna talk about football. Yeah. We're just gonna try chicken tenders <laughs> and wings across the state of Utah. We could do the. You know, yeah. how hot can you do it? Like, I mean, I can eat pretty hot. How How about you? Ooh. I don't know. I'd be seeing that one podcast that they'd be doing with the hot sauce and the different levels. I don't know. I can do pretty hot, but when, when it's time to tap out, somebody give me some milk. <laughs> that, I, you, I, 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 I can't stand spice. Like but like a one on a scale from one to ten is probably as hot as I can get. So Mexican food, uh, if it gets too spicy, I can't do it. Oh, we can't do it. See, I'm, yeah, going to, I'm, going going pretty Rob. I'm going pretty bird and I'm going hot behind. I'm going like anything I know, that I can you get. get. Like battery acid coming out the other end. It's like, yeah, I can't, I can't do that. He's looking towards the future. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm here for a good time in a long time, Rob. I'm here for the moment. You know, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like the spiciest thing. Like, like even sometimes even like the, uh, the salsa verde Doritos are a little bit too spicy for oh, me. So it's like, man. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty weak when it comes to spice. Um, I, I, I'm more of a flavor guy. Like it, you, you make it too spicy, you don't taste the food, right? You can have hot and, and flavor at the same time. As you're crying out the uh, jalapeno nah, tears. No crying. 
I thought I was Team Rob on the food discussion, but now I'm in the middle. I'm torn. I'm torn. I'm in the middle now. Team glass of milk over here. Look, look. I'll take the chicken wings, and then we can we can go on our hot binge together, and we'll leave Rob to the dust. Let's do it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh man. I look food. We'll we'll do it. This is gonna be our next podcast. Okay, no more football. You're gonna you're gonna give up your career as a football player, and we're gonna go all foodie. How about that? Oh man, that would take a crazy turn. <laughs> <laughs> go, go explain that to mom and dad, right? Hey, uh, yeah, for real. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for supporting me, but nah. That's funny. Oh man, that. I mean, they can can they even see our faces on the on the podcast? It's just audio, right? It's just audio. We, I mean, we, we'd have to make it a visual if we're gonna do it that way, right? That's what I'm saying. And then we have to see Rob tearing up when you get him some. Uh, <laughs> I'll try anything. Hot I'll barbecue, try it, but <laughs> it may not look pretty. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> I'll at least try it. How about that? I want to see you get to at least a level five. Level five. Okay. I, you know, I mean, next time we're next time I'm in Salt Lake, we'll do Pretty Bird, and we'll do a level five. What is that? Like their medium? Is that big glass of milk? Is that what I'm talking about, Rob? That's the energy we (laughs) need, Rob. I'll I'll do. I'll do it for the show. (laughs) Yes, sir. Okay. Let's do it. You thought you were coming on to talk about football, and now we've derailed your entire life. Yeah, hot chicken or I don't even know. All right, football time. <laughs> All right, let's go well, football. What did you have? For, what did you have? For, what do you guys have for lunch? What did you guys have for lunch today? How about that? We, we know what Josh had. What did you have, Solo? Oh, how do y'all feel about this? Lemon pepper tuna fish sandwiches. I'm not. A, I'm not a fan of. Pe- Le- uh, lemon look. goes with fish. I'm, I can get behind that. I'm no tuna fish guy though. I like fish and I like all that, but I'm not a tuna fish. Really? No. Maybe in That's sushi. Like- Maybe in sushi. That's a good go-to for me. Like when I need something quick, I'll just throw it together and get that protein in. And is it out of a can, or are you making it like frozen? Where, where no, is it's this? like the. I forget what package it's out of, but that I just throw it in the bowl, mix it in with a little bit of mayo, get some of the, those peppers and seasonings in there, get it tasting good, get some takis with it, some okay. Doritos, whatever okay. you want to choose. Once, you know? a, once again, Rob's not eating the takis. No. Nah. No. Nah. <laughs> we'll let Sorry. Down here. <laughs> we still love you, Rob. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so, is your pantry like stocked? Like, how do, how does that work? Do you have like like a little shop that you just go down to the U Athletic Center and just stock up with stuff, or like do they make you buy your own groceries? Oh like, no, they they take care of us food wise. Well, it depends because they we have certain. There's like um there's like some rules and regulations to like how many meals we get, but we do have like the fueling station so, where it has like, let snacks. me get this straight. So they're, they're going to give you money, you know, through the NIL and stuff, but then they're going to say you can only have X amount of meals. What about that old block? Like you, you can't tell me they only get three meals a day. I mean, they, they gotta be eating all day. Well, sometimes if we're there all day, we'll get three meals. Like fall camp, we'll get three meals, but like when it's spread out through practice or like by week, some, some days we get two meals. If it's a shorter day when we're not there all day, we get one meal. You know stuff like that, but um, I mean they still take care of us, so they make sure okay. that it's not like okay, you get one meal, you're not eating the whole day. Like they make sure that there's snacks or anything around the facility. Like they take care of us. It's it's all good up there. Yeah, I've heard. I don't want to make it seem like they starve us. So <laughs> I, I remember. I'm trying to remember what basketball player that was years ago that said that they weren't getting a lot of food. I mean, obviously a lot has changed in the NCAA since then, but. Uh, I remember hearing somebody that it's like, it's, it's tough, right? Like it's, it's not easy being a student athlete. And obviously some of those have been relaxed now and, uh, you're able to get more and people can feed you more and different things that way. But it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to bring you guys on as a scholarship athlete and then have all this stuff and then not really let you have what we have. That's not what we're saying here, but like in the past, right? Like crazy to think Mm -hmm. that that was even a a, a thought and it's just more, look, I'll say it. The NCAA just is a scam. So (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, when I was coming up through high school, I mean, a lot of my coaches played in, in college and they would say like there was only there was times where they would end up with three hundred dollars a month that they would just have to. That's like or four hundred or then that, they had to take care of a whole bunch of stuff, plus food, plus this. You would trade people this, this. I'm just like, I mean, we came a long way. Mm-hmm. But I mean, what you're saying is like from like past experiences, I've heard it, too, from like my older coaches and stuff like that. Which is crazy to think of. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's it's good that you guys are where you're at, right? Like, I mean, it's hard enough just to think about the fact of how much football you'd have to do. Then you'd have to probably get a side job if you could. And even then, I don't know how, I mean, that's got to be hard to get around NCA regulations and stuff like that. But we're not there now. So let's not dwell on that past. But 
let's yeah. let's jump into the bye week. So so what does a bye week look like for you at the University of Utah? Obviously, it's a little different in the sense that you have a game on Thursday, so it's a shortened bye week, but uh, it's still a bye week nonetheless. Yeah, so, um, I mean, same old, same old how regular bye week would go. A lot of guys needed it, and it, uh, it was beneficial, um, you know, just to heal up those bumps and bruises, especially after that those stretch, the stretch that we had already. Um, and then a lot of game planning, a lot of watching film, and then just right back to it, like nothing, like a bye week never happened, right back to practice and just hop right back in. Is, is this a condensed week for you guys? Uh, you know, you have the game coming up Thursday. It's on the road. Does, does, do you skip a day? Do you not do you walk through? Like, how does a shortened week kind of factor in when you had the bye last week and then the game on Thursday this week on the road? Um, yeah, so they, they make sure we have a, enough time to get our bodies back, get the recovery we need. But, you know, we're still practicing. I think that's just, I mean, Coach Witt is big on preparation. Our whole program is built off of that. Our culture is built off of the haze never in the barn. Um, so, I mean, we're still, yeah, it's at the the game is pushed up, but now we've had to alter days that they turned into like regular days of the game week. So, for example, Friday's practice would have been more of, I mean, I can't even think of it. But basically like our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, leading up to that game, it's all just altered and switched around. So it equals up to Thursday being like a Saturday game. So nothing much really changes. You lose track of dates and days a little bit, but I mean, at the end of the day, football is just football. We're just preparing every day. Kyle talked about uh, in the press conference today that he's, you know, he's always been a, a run first team. At least maybe that's how he's tried to develop it. Um, but this year there's been a little bit more passing at the end. Obviously you guys have a good run, run game and everything that way. Do you, do you feel like there's been a change in, in this or do you feel like there's a different scheming that way? Or is it just whoever's got the hot hand? I think you talked about that a few weeks ago, whoever's got the hot hand, you just keep going with. Yeah, I think it's just week to week game by game. It just, that's how you would adjust. I mean, we prepare every week that we're going to run the ball and throw the ball. There's no week where it's like, all right, we're going to, pound the ball and not forget to throw it or we're going to just throw the ball out, air the ball out and forget to run it. I think every week it changes. And I think it's just, you know, credit to our running back room. If they're loading up the boxes and playing one-on-ones on the outside, then you have, you just take those, uh, those matchups on the outside because it's one-on-one. But if they're zoning it out, spreading out a little bit, just take advantage of the box numbers and run the ball. So I think it just varies. I mean, we have, we have strong, we have a strong group across the board on offense, running back, O-line, quarterback, receivers especially tight ends um i mean you can go down every group and name someone from that group or name a couple guys from that group that our offense utilizes very well and coach led knows that and uh you know i think it just varies week to week game plan to game plan last week you guys obviously get uh well the week before the bye week you guys obviously get that you know big emotional win it, it took a lot to be able to get there especially trailing down how how hard is it to be able to keep that momentum moving forward do you do you feel that kind of fizzle out as the weeks go or or is it nice to be able to kind of have that for a two week stretch knowing that you're going into a hostile environment um i would just say that never ride the highs too high never ride the lows too low i think you know, just be where your feet are, enjoy the moment, but make sure that you don't lose hindsight of what you got going on or what you, what you, what the team's got going on. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the win was great, and, you know, it felt good and um, definitely gave us a boost. But that game is not going to make us win this game Thursday night in Pullman, Washington. So um, it's just back to the drawing board. It's, you know, being where your feet are, understand that we have a good team now. We just have to keep showing it. We can't just not show up, especially on the road. Um, good teams play on the road and one on the road. So, you know, it's just, we're going to take it day by day. Like I always say, I feel like I'm a, a broken record when it comes to that, but you know, we just have to prepare every day, win every day, win every rep. And, um, you know, that gives us a better chance of coming out with a W. What, what makes Washington state such a, a difficult environment to play in? I mean, is, is it a difficult, is it up there at one of those or is, or is it just a, a different environment? Cause it's kind of so far out there. No, it's definitely a tough environment to play in. I think so. The only time I played there was 2018, my freshman year. But I'll never forget the moment where, so I'm a freshman, whatever, whatever. Um, the stadium starts saying, like, pull your keys out and start shaking your keys in the crowd. So everyone was shaking their keys. And it was, you'd be surprised how loud it was just from that alone. Like, I was like, 
it like triggers some PTSD of mine. Like, I'm like, what is going on? Um, no, it gets loud and it's, you know, it's a great environment. And I, I already know Thursday night it's going to be rocking. It's seven o'clock game over there, eight o'clock here. Um, you know, the environment's going to be crazy. I know. So we just, we got to be ready and prepare for it. And what can you tell us about uh, uh, Washington State's quarterback, you know, as you've watched some film, uh, you know, transfer in and a lot of, you know, transfer quarterbacks coming into the Pac-12 this year. But he's one of the guys that uh, we've kind of circled as, you know, a guy that um, could be, you know, really good. He's had some ups and downs. But what can you tell us about Cam Ward? I mean, I didn't really know much about him when he came in, but just watching them play like Wisconsin and playing against Oregon and, you know, he seems like a really solid quarterback, you know, that Washington state really, you know, has wrapped their offense around and he's taken full, full steam ahead with it, you know, and, you know, I, I haven't really watched much film on him just because he's on the offense side of the ball, but just when I've seen from watching games and stuff, I mean, it seems like such a good fit for him and he looks like he's comfortable with the offense and he looks like he can run the offense really well. And the guys respond well around him. Um, you know, I'm not sure where school he came from before, but I mean, that's good to see that he's thriving, especially after transferring. Because sometimes that can be hard. Someone transfers into a new program, they don't really get it. But he seems like he understands it, and they're you know they're both backing each other 100. percent If I remember right, last was it last year where there was like all those those fumbles you guys had against Washington State, where it just felt like you guys you couldn't get into a rhythm or anything like that. How what what's an environment like that where it's just like you you can't keep going right? Like it's just like every time you touch the ball, something happens. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know how many times we won the ball. Was it like eight? I don't remember what it, the number was. All I know is it was a lot. But Coach Wood always says we're going to face adversity sometime in this game is how you respond to it. And, you know, that just, I mean, it was a little longer than we would like for it to be because, you know, I mean, if sometimes you get that one hit on the ball that you can't control. But most of the time, 99% of the time, you got to have good ball security. You can't be turn over the ball because once that turnover margin starts going against you, then – the winning factor just or percentage just drops for you. So, you know, we got to do a good job of, you know, controlling the ball. And, you know, they did great last year getting the ball out. You know, we had some things to work on ball security wise, but I mean, they're a great team. They knew when to punch out and stuff like that. So, yeah, we just got to make sure that, you know, we keep those turnovers down and, uh, you know, just when we have the ball, just take care of it. Because like Coach Witt says, we only get 10 possessions, maybe a game in this day and age of college football. So you have to cherish those and make sure you're you're getting the most out of those 10, those 10 uh, drives. Washington State, obviously, coming off two straight losses, but you, you go back a couple of weeks, they took Oregon down to the wire. And for, you know, the last four minutes of that game, if it, you know, it may not, if you don't throw a pick six or, you know, it, you always play coulda, shoulda, woulda. But, you know, Washington State was in control of that game until Oregon stormed back. How, I mean, does that change your perspective, you know, knowing that, you know, on their home field, they're, they they play a little bit better than, you know, they may do on the road, or does that does that not even play a factor? You guys are just going to go in and, and play your game. I mean, we just have to play Utah football. They're a great team. Playing at home, it's going to be a great environment. They're going to be ready for it. I mean, that's how it was for us for USC. We knew it was going to be a big game. Crowd was a huge plus for us. And, um, you know, they're a great team. You know, just me, I mean, put on the tape. And like you said, they came up short a couple of times. Um, but they came up a sh a short a couple of times. Like, they could have won those games. You know, it came down to maybe a couple of plays or a handful of plays. But they're a great team. We know we're, they're gonna, we're gonna get our, we're going to get their best shot in a great environment at their home stadium. And uh, we just got to be ready for it. Just, you know, prepare like we can and, you know, know our assignment, execute it, and just play Utah football at the end of the day. The Pac-12 hasn't always been known for, like, a defensive def uh, destination, right? Like, obviously, you, Stanford, uh, there's been some other teams up and down where the, the defense has, has been pretty good. But it seems like this year the defense has improved across the Pac-12. Are, are you seeing that, or, or are there different things that you can see that kind of show what's going on in the Pac-12? Or is there a different year where you feel like, oh, it was really tough going against these, these teams because everybody was stacked? You know, I just think it goes into the, con the conversation of how – competitive the Pac-12 really is. I mean, people are always, always saying something bad about, about the Pac-12, but it's like, since we play each other so much, that's why, you know, we have such good teams in the Pac-12 that there's not always one that's like, oh my goodness, like they're standouts. I mean, you always have those one or two, 
but it's just such a competitive league and we're always playing each other. It's just something's bound to happen. I mean, it's football. You can, you can never really predict football the way you think you can because something always can change up. Or like how we were just talking about a couple of seconds ago, it's one or two plays that can change the whole game. You know, I think it's just the Pac-12 is just such a competitive conference. And, you know, we got great teams from the south to the north. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just falling back on our defense, you know, I think we have one of the best defenses in the Pac-12. Um, you know, we have a lot of stuff. I mean, it's football. You can never be perfect at it. There's something to always work on. But, you know, we have a great young defense, and, you know, they're progressing very well throughout the season. I think they're hitting strides at the good, like the right time. How, uh, from a defensive perspective, are the, are the coaches just preaching, hey, just go out and do your 111th? Like we, we saw a couple big plays given up against USC, and, you know, sometimes you just have to tip your cap to the other team. Like they're good players too, right? Like <laughs> there's, there's obviously a reason why, every, you know, Jordan Addison was – you know, uh, highly recruited or, the, you know, such a high transfer guy uh, coming out of pit and coming to USC. And, you know, they have a ton of talent over there. But from a defensive perspective, how much of it is just, you know, everybody has to do their assignment and not try to make that big play, you know, try to create the turnover, create the, you know, tackle for a loss and just, you know, kind of just stay in your responsibility, make sure that you take control of your kind of 111, so to speak. Yeah, Coach Scali always preaches that just, you know, your 111, owning your own 20 square feet. Um, you know, he always preaches and harps on that. And I think people just, you know, Coach Scali has had, has had so much success with our defense. People forget that these other teams, they have scholarship players. Their coaches get paid to. They're on a year, year-to-year salary. Um, you know, they're paid to get coached, and they have scholarship players that are, are here to play. So, and again, it's the game of football. Plays are going to happen. It's not one team's going to go in and, well, I mean, it, it happens sometimes. You can steamroll one team, but, you know, when you get in those really good games against, when you get two good teams playing against each other, there's some something's got to give sometimes. It's not always going to be perfect. There's always going to be those plays that happen on both sides of the ball. But like I said, it's just how you respond to it. Um, if you're built for adversity and you don't run away from it, that's the best solution to those to those issues or if, if anything pops up. So, you know, Coach Scali is a great coach, and he always preaches that. Um but like I said, I mean, these other teams, they got coaches that are paid just like we have coaches that are paid and we have players on scholarship that play just like these other teams do too as well. So um, I think that's just the the biggest point of emphasis on that. A, a lot of people like to talk about uh, Scally as being kind of the next man up for, for Whittingham whenever he decides to retire. And I'm not, I don't want you to feel like you have to comment on that by any means, but who, who, what are the coach or who in the coaching staff do you feel like is going to be that, that head coach, not necessarily at Utah, but anywhere, or are there guys that you feel like are, are kind of in that trajectory? I'm not sure. I mean, that's a tough question to really answer just because of the fact that this is like my, really my last year and coaching always coach. You, I mean, I still look on Twitter and see coaching changes that happen that I wouldn't believe have happened, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Coach Scali's next up. I'm not really sure. I know I won't be here when it happens, but you know, it's kind of hard to answer to pick. Like, you know, because we have so we have so many good coaches in in that building, like Coach Harden, for example, um, Coach Shaw. You know, I can name them all, uh, Coach Scali. But you know, I think it's whatever when that time comes. You know, Mark Harlan will, will sit down and make the decision, and you know, amongst whoever he talks to to make it happen. But I know at that time given what the situation is, they'll pick someone really good for this program. It's funny because you mentioned Coach Harding, and he seems like a really introverted guy uh, in terms of just doesn't really want to be in the spotlight, doesn't want to be that guy. But obviously he, he's earned a lot of respect when he came into the program. Kyle you know, made him kind of his, his right-hand man for a while and, and did different things that way. What, what is it about him and what you've seen? And I know you don't work closely with him necessarily in that room, but what is it about him that maybe fans don't see because it feels like he's kind of the one behind the scenes that just, just kind of quietly doing his job? I love Coach Harden. He just, you could just see that he has so much passion and love for the game. And, um, you know, during the games in those, in those huddles before we break to go, like when we have those TV timeouts or anything like that, he'll talk to the group. And, you know, I just, it's like, I ha like, I have to like, look at him. It's like this, like just what he's saying, you know, you just respect so much what he says and he knows and his knowledge for the game and his passion and his, his love for the game is just contagious. And, like you said, he's very, I mean, on the outside looking in, he could look introverted or whatever, but 
man, at practice and games, he's flying around screaming, having fun. And, you know, it's contagious just bringing that energy and, you know, it radiating amongst uh, the other players, and including myself. I do have to admit, watching coaches when they're coaching is, is kind of an interesting thing because you have these guys that are, uh, uh, I wouldn't say reserved, but they're a lot more, uh, uh, I don't even know what to describe them. They're just a different person, and then you go watch them coach, and it's just like they're fiery, and, and you see a whole other side of them. I mean, that's got to be an interesting perspective to kind of see some of these guys when you when you go on as a recruit and you're looking at these guys. And I know you get some of that experience on official visits, but to be able to then get into it, I mean, is it any different than – than uh, high school coaches or anything that way? Like, does the intensity change? Well, I I would say it changes a little bit. I mean, just with these college coaches, it's business, but we're still playing a kid's game. You know, and that's where that, that, that business front comes up. But when it's time to play, I mean, we're still playing a kid's game that we all played and grew up watching when we were younger. So, like, you can't help but just, you know, have that fire and energy running around. And if you don't, then you shouldn't be playing football, you know? Um, but comparing it to high school to college, I mean, there's more, I mean, there's more on the line when it comes from high school to college in the sense of there's jobs, there's money because of TV deals, this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, it's just football. You know, the business was slapped over football. I, I mean, you can go to the park and play football. You know, it's, it's still a kid's game. And I think sometimes people get caught up in, you know, championships, this, that, and the other, but like, obviously you want to win, but it's, it's football, man. It's not the end of the world. Um, but yeah, I think all of our coaches, they're just like that. They're very business-like but when it's time to have fun and, and have that passion, that energy and run around screaming and just having fun with it. I think, you know, they have that switch. Uh, so obviously you have, I, this is completely off topic, but you have a brother that's in MMA world. What, what's what's that like to be able to have a brother in that world? And do, do you get to talk to him much about it? Or, I mean, obviously you're doing your thing. What What's that like? Yeah, so we, so my family, I actually grew up around that a lot. My family's um, very into that. And that's just how we base our life. Oh, not base our life around, but it's very included in our life. Uh, you know, we have family that's been in the military. We've had um, other MMA fighters. It's just fighting and training and not in the sense of like becoming an MMA fighter, but like self-defense and, you know, tying that with the military, you know, that's big in, in my family. Um, but yeah, he's an MMA fighter right now. He actually had a fight this past weekend and we were watching at the house here and he lost by unanimous decision. But see, this is why like, I'm just putting it out there now because we're on the podcast and we have the platform. <laughs> I love it. But he should have, he should have won that fight just because I don't know if you guys watch, you know, at UFC at all, but you should not score points from someone leaning on you against the cage. Cause the guy he was fighting the whole time was literally leaning on him and they called it pressure. Like he was giving pressure, like just leaning on him the whole time, but they showed the highlights of the fight. And my brother was literally working him the whole highlight. And at the end of it, they raised the other kid's hand. So I'm just like, I'm still kind of bent over. I was, <laughs> I was pissed off Saturday night. I'll tell you what I was, in my living room, screaming at the TV, throwing shadow boxing at the TV and all. Um, but no, I mean, that's his passion. That his, that's his dream. Um, the biggest thing was he had to go get his degree before he can do that. That was his That was his deal with my parents. So he did that, and now he's living out his dream. And, um, you know, it'll pay off. I just this last past weekend had me bent a little bit from <laughs> the decision. So we're going to submit this to the MMA and uh... – let them let them sort that out. How about that? Oh, please, yeah. <laughs> oh man, I'm like trying to like I'm trying to keep myself like reserved and not, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, they they made the decision and you got to live with it. But like, come on, man. Like, it's like when a ref throws a flag that everyone knows shouldn't be a flag, and you're just like, come on, man. Like, you can't change it, but it happened. You know, it's just and you sit there and think about it over and over and over, but it's all good. We're still, we're still here though. If you ask USC fans, that's how they, how you guys won. So yeah, we're not even going to talk about that. <laughs> I know. I know. Keep that, I don't want to be for a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be in our food one. When we, when, when you're not a player anymore and we can talk about food and flags. Crying, sweating from hot. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that for hot topics with Josh Furlong and, and Rob Jackson. It'll be cold takes from uh, Rob, though. Yeah. <laughs> Served with a glass of milk. Here we go. I'm Team Rob and so, Josh. So we we gonna, we going to see you in the MMA ring, MMA ring one of these days? 
I ain't, I don't think I'm built for MMA. Okay. That's tough. You got to have that. That's a different mentality going into that ring. You have to be a little crazy too, don't you? Yeah, just imagine someone kicking you in the face and like <laughs> you can't get pissed off and lose your composure because that's when everything goes south. But like there's an art to it, you know, and it's just you have to have that little screw loose in your head for that. I, I don't know. I mean, if it was like the end of the world and I needed to, maybe. But I don't know if those kicks, man, vicious. I don't, I don't know. know how you do. I don't know how you do that, and then still be able to like function after that, you know. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, I mean, just slap your shin one time and feel that coming like hitting you in the head at full speed. I, I stub my toe on the dresser coming out of my kid's room or something, <laughs> and I'm I'm done for the day. <laughs> so no, I get stuck I get on my O block, and that my toe just feels like it's ripping. Up. I'm like, uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, football's kind of the same. It's physical, but not like that. You ain't got no. You only got a mouthpiece, and that's it. Yeah, I I, so. I can't imagine taking hits to the face with the leg, or you know, being punched or anything. I don't know. That, that's and you different. hear the crowd, ooh, ooh, <laughs> yeah. and you're just like, damn, am I getting beat up right now? Like I came into <laughs> my eyes halfway outside of the socket. You know, <laughs> it's did I saw Cam Rising, and I think it was uh, was it Dalton? They went to the UFC card here. Uh, did you? Did any of you guys go, or did you go? Or yeah, so my girlfriend and I went. Okay, and man, it was a great time. That, that it was such a good time. Just see, like it's crazy though. Like this sport, like how, like so much of a gladiator sport it is. But like it, you have a lot of appreciation for these fighters because they put so much time in, and you can tell like they're really working it. And you know, it was just in Salt Lake. I mean, killed it with like. The fans and everyone, man, it, it was insane. I loved it. That's awesome. Did I, you guys get to go at all or I, no? I had, uh, I had a press credential to go, but then I couldn't make it go. I can't remember what it was. I think I had a kid's baseball tournament or something, and mm-hmm. I, I think it would be a blast. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge MMA guy. I haven't watched a ton of it, um, but I, I, I like the idea of it, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I think I would watch it. I just haven't had time for it. I don't know about Easy, Rob. Man. Yeah, what do you think, Rob? I'm all for it. You know, I, uh, I've never been in person. I didn't get the chance to go this last time out, but, uh, you know, if I think that, uh, if you're offering to babysit the kids, then uh, <laughs> I'll take the wife. We'll go. So we need, <laughs> that's the hard thing with three young kids. It's hard to do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that uh, one day, it doesn't get easier when they get older, man. Once they're teenagers, no. they don't get easier either. No. <laughs> you gotta at least give me some hope. No. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I can't. I, I'm not speaking on it because I don't know nothing about it. So y'all on your own with that one. There's no hope. Just it's there's no hope. No, I'm just kidding. No, I actually have. It, it's fun. Like when kids get older, I actually have my kids. They'll do podcasts on their own now. Um, and so they. That's awesome. My uh, my eight year old. He really wanted to do a podcast over the weekend, and he uh, he he had this whole thing scripted out wanted to go write it and so we sit there and he's talking about all of his favorite NFL teams and like talking about how they're undefeated or this and that and it's it's fun. I enjoy that kind of stuff now that they're older and they they love the sport. I mean, they make their own top 25 lists every week and criticize me when I don't have teams in certain spots or whatever. So, it's fun. <laughs> that would be that would be an awesome podcast to have. Yeah. You you can go on with them too if you want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and I will do. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll tell my ki- kids to pony up. and. Uh... <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's good to hear. All right, Solo. We appreciate you coming every time and uh, hope you had a good bye week and, and that you guys are all healed up and, and you're ready to go. Any, anything, any parting words before uh, we send you on your way? As always, subscribe to these guys, man. They're great people. We have a great time. And if we, if we get more subscribers on it, then we'll, we'll give you a little hot take and, and you guys pick where we got to eat food from and we'll make it a little a visual podcast. I don't know how it's going to work, but make sure y'all show some love and support. Share it to, send it to your friend, your auntie, anybody you know. And uh, as always, it was good being with you guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. Have a, have a good one. You as well. Bye. Yeah. Go get some good chicken wings. <laughs> All right, Joe. <laughs> Take care. Oh, we got we got chicken wings. We've got uh, MMA. I, this food podcast is a great idea, man. Like especially right around lunchtime, you know, man. Like people, people, want, people would uh, hit that up. You know, I'm I'm just uh, salivating over here thinking about chicken wings now. <laughs> just yeah. not spicy ones. No, I mean, I like the spicy <laughs> ones when it comes to that. I know. I've, yeah, I mean, you always get the uh, the what is it? The hot behind <laughs> pretty bird. Yeah, I can't do it. See, I feel like uh, just, I feel like Pretty Bird's hot behind has gotten 
less spicy, and I'm a little upset by that. I don't like I don't like going to places and they're like, oh, this is really spicy, and then you go try it, and it's like, yeah, it's fine. But I know for other people, like my wife, for example, she's she 100% does not like spice. So for her, that would be like destroying her, her taste buds and everything. But for me, it's like, nah, I've had hotter, so... I don't know. No. <laughs> I, I think it's like an acclimation thing, and I just need to start working my way up slowly, you know, and eventually one day I'll be able to, to keep up with you. But uh, as of now, and I am, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stick to the Cool Ranch Doritos and stay away from the <laughs> Salsa Verde ones. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's a good jam. I'm not going to lie. Well, you know, uh, you can't go wrong with some Doritos and some Mountain Dew. So no. if they want to sponsor us too, you know, we'll free to lay. <laughs> just... It's just coming we'll, we'll Pepsi Corporation. Uh, we're we're taking offers. You know, it's, it's, you know, talking about hot teams, Oregon um absolutely dismantled UCLA. Um the college game day was there, big day in Eugene, and Bo Nix and company took care of business against, you know, a really good UCLA team that obviously, you know, got the best of Utah in the Rose Bowl. So what what are your two takeaways from Oregon and UCLA? Is this uh, a sign of more things to come for UCLA, or is, I mean, or is this just Oregon was just too good on this day at home? Um, yeah, kind of. What were your impressions on that one? Yeah, I think it's probably a little bit of that one, right? Where it's it was a good day for Oregon. I think what what uh, Oregon's really gotten out of Bo Nix has been phenomenal. He's played some really great football. You know, watching him in Auburn was was kind of a frustrating experience because there was times where you saw the ability that he had. And then at other times, it was just so frustrating to see what he was doing. And so when he came up to, to Oregon, you know, I think I even said it on this podcast, I was skeptical, right? Like, I didn't think that that he would be able to do well. But for whatever reason, he's had a good restart up there outside of that Georgia game. Um, they, they've done really well, and, and they took it to, to UCLA, right? Like, I think it was John Canzano that said over the weekend that Oregon – out Chip Kelly, Chip Kelly, right? Like they went out there and, and they did something to him that he wasn't expecting. They kept him on his toes and, and and really just took it to him in a way that that UCLA couldn't do anything, right? Like it's not like UCLA was a bad team or that they, they had a bad day. I don't even think they punted that day. The fact is they, they didn't punt and they still got blown out. I mean, that's 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 the crazy level of, of experience that that Oregon team has been operating under and, and being able to do that under a first-year head coach who who's really not necessarily offensively driven – They've been able to to hire the right people. They've been able to do the right things, and and it's really working out. You know, look, I don't I don't know if Oregon is that much better of a UCLA team. I think they are good. Um, I don't want to say that they're not the best in the conference because they absolutely are. But I'm curious to see, right? Like, was UCLA uh, kind of caught where they you know in a tough environment? Autzen Stadium, quite honestly, is one of the toughest places to play in the Pac-12, and so maybe it was a little bit of all of that and. And everything, because I still think UCLA is a good team. They've got good chemistry. They've, they, you know, they've got everything there. But it's a pivotal game that that UCLA lost, and now they're sitting in a situation where even though they only have one conference loss, that's going to be really difficult. You still got USC that you got to go, and that that game is going to be crazy. It's going to be a toss up type game. You know what what happens right now? Does you know going six and zero and and having all the success mean anything at the end when you can't get to the championship? That's that's tough. I don't know. That's it, it, it's a tough uh, scenario in, in in the way the conference is shaking out now, where the top two teams come and you don't necessarily have to beat everybody else in your division. It's now you've got to beat everybody. And 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 I think in in some respects that that really hurt UCLA in that loss. What about you? Well, uh, two takeaways from this one and. And, and the first is a credit to Utah is you never want to be playing. You never want to play a, a good opponent the week after you have to play Utah sure. because you're getting beat up. And we saw it with U- UCLA. UCLA obviously got the win, but they were beat up. You, you saw the guys limp into the sideline. I, mean, I don't know what their injury report looked like, but it's just a physical game every time that you play Utah. And so to have to play Utah and then go on the road and play uh, Oregon the next week, that's tough. That's Another tough physical task. team. Um, well, I guess there was two weeks in between. So, um, you know, it, it's a, it's it's one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, you, you just playing those tough opponents, um, it, it can just take its toll on you. The second thing is home field advantage in the Pac-12 has been on display this year. We saw it with Utah edging out USC. We saw it again here this last weekend with Oregon, you know, defeating UCLA. This is uh, I for what I, I I think I saw a stat from John Wilner that the home favorites are like, like uh, undefeated in Pac-12 play. Is that, is I, that think was, maybe I think it was maybe the thirty to one. 
think it was 30 to 1 if the or was it 30 to 1 that seems high uh something like that where if, if you the home team was favored or something like that or i can't remember but it, it's a high right. number it, yeah and, and and we saw it again on display you know uh saturday in Austin. so that that environment was electric you know obviously college anytime you have college game day it kind of adds to the the environment but i mean Austin doesn't need any uh additional things to make that a great environment you just need a good team and, uh, you know, that was a, the first time that the Pac-12 has had a top 10 matchup in years. And it uh, it didn't disappoint. Uh, I guess it did if you were a UCLA fan. But, uh, I mean, what a great what a great game. Uh, a great, I mean, yeah, one punt for both teams the entire day. Um, and uh, Oregon obviously outlasts uh, UCLA and gets the 15-point win. Other than that, there really wasn't a whole lot of, uh, you know, football being, you know, good football being played in the Pac-12. We saw Washington defeat Cal. Like seven on the road, uh, you know, you, you just wonder how motivating it is to go uh, into Berkeley and play. Um, you know, Washington improves to six and two. We saw Oregon State just throttle uh, Colorado at home, forty-two to nine, and then we saw a Stanford team defeat Arizona State fifteen to fourteen. And this is a couple games in a row where Stanford has won while putting up, you know, I, I wouldn't say baseball type scores, but similar. Like they're not scoring a ton of points, but they're they're still finding a way to win. And that's, you know, with, you know, maybe 200 people in the stands, <laughs> uh, maybe that's generous, but, uh, you know, I, I, well, I know what are your two kind of takeaways from the, the you know, the, the, the weekend in Pac-12 outside of that Oregon game? Did anything stand out to you? Um, because it was just kind of like a whole hum you know, status quo type of week for me. Yeah, I, I, I kind of came away with the, the same impression over this weekend, right? Like the, the Stanford win surprised me a little bit. Um, but not enough to really change anything in my eyes. It really wasn't a weekend that that convinced me about anything other than maybe Oregon, right? Like I, I watched that and I was really intrigued. I, you know, following that game, I decided to kind of look at, well, you know, I like to look at the, the, you know, the conference odds and different things that way, how the things are, the season's going to stack out. And it, it's interesting to me that, you know, if you look at taking Utah as, as the team, if you look at Utah, they're favored in every single game for the remainder of the season except for that Oregon game. And now, you know, I would have expected that uh, Oregon would have been favored by a lot more. But, you know, if you look at ESPN, there's other metrics that you can look at, but I'm just going to simplify it with the ESPN's FPI. They, they have it almost as a toss-up game still, which is, is crazy. It's in Austin Stadium. It's in, you know, in an environment that's still really tough. And, you know, it's, it's a scenario where that game is still a toss up. So it's like, you know, we've, we've looked at this Utah team and I think a lot of people have been really frustrated at, at times with, with how Utah's played, especially after that UCLA loss. It, it, this team is still a, a team that can compete with the, the upper echelon teams in the Pac-12, right? Like you obviously beat USC, uh, UCLA was a bad one, but now you get o- Oregon. And quite honestly, that's going to be the game that's going to decide, in my eyes, the Pac-12 championship game, right? It's one of those games where you've got your top four teams. You still have Oregon, UCLA, USC, and Utah. I think those four have really cemented themselves as the top four in the league. Outside of that, you have Oregon State and, to some extent, Washington, although I don't I don't know if I would want to categorize them there. They're still kind of lurking, right? But but you've got these teams that are all trying to compete for that Pac-12 championship, and it's you know you, you get a nice win against UCLA for Oregon, and you're still kind of in this locked battle with with the remainder of the teams, even though you haven't lost in conference play. So it's it's going to be interesting. That's still three weeks away. There's there's nothing to worry about in in that respect. Utah's still got to win out. They've got to be able to do what they need to do to get there. Um, it's it's a tough road, but look, this weekend didn't change my opinion on anything. If anything, I was I was left more impressed by Oregon and, and their ability to be able to do it. But the reality is, is they've still got games to play as well. They've got to slip up. Um, you know, Oregon State's going to be a tough game for them. It's not going to be an easy game. So the the remainder stretch for these teams isn't necessarily going to be easy, and I don't think it's going to be easy to figure out who's in that championship game for quite a while. No, so I mean, you talk about um, not letting a team beat you twice, and you look at who UCLA plays this next week, and you know I'm not calling the upset, but I I think that if UCLA kind of has that hangover from from losing on Saturday to Oregon, they could potentially lose to Stanford, and that's a that's a tough matchup. Oregon goes on the road uh, and plays at Cal, and I, I know that Cal kind of hung with Washington. Uh, but I, I don't I don't think that that game's close. The, the interesting stretch for me for Oregon is the last three games of the season where you have to play Washington at home mm-hmm. in an emotional rivalry game. Uh, then they play Utah at home, which, I mean, they're going to want revenge from the two beatdowns that they had last season. 
and then they have to go on the road to Corvallis to play another emotionally charged rivalry game in the Civil War. That I mean, that's a tough three game stretch for Oregon. That you know, even if you go and skate up until that Washington game, like who knows? Like you could end the season nine and zero in conference play, or you could end the season six and three, and none of those would necessarily surprise me. Uh, because, you know, that's just a tough three-game stretch to prepare for. We saw it with Utah. They had a four-game stretch that looked daunting, and they tripped up. They tripped up against UCLA, and we'll see how they do Thursday night in Pullman. That's a tough place to play. Uh, Historically, Utah uh, hasn't performed super well against air raid-type offenses, Um, and, you know, Cam Ward can can maneuver around in the pocket. I don't don't know. I haven't made my pick yet in Pickham, but, uh, you know, you would think coming off a bye week, Utah would – you know, make the necessary adjustments defensively to to slow down and and Oregon State. Oregon State has a really good secondary, so you know you just never know. They held Washington State to uh, was it ten points? Yeah, so, yeah, I believe um, so. yeah. We'll we'll see how how these games shake out and and whatnot. But as far as Pickham is concerned, um, I think I I am the only one in the group that correctly predicted Liberty versus BYU, um, largely because you told me to switch. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I hey, said, and I'll be completely honest. I had BYU winning big, and I looked at the uh, uh, the predictions, and I was like, well, "We can't have chalk here. Like Liberty is too good to to go chalk." And so I flipped my pick, and I happened to be right. So I got lucky. But oh, is there anything that you saw in that game that uh, I mean, BYU's lost three in a row. Uh, they're suddenly down to to five hundred. And this isn't a BYU podcast. And I don't want to spend a ton of ton of, ton of time on this, but it seems like they've hit their the rock bottom point of the season. Like Liberty's a good team. Like, don't get me wrong, but going on the road and having that um, kind of face fall flat on the concrete type of moment didn't look good for Kalani Sataki or BYU. No. What are your thoughts? What are your takeaways from it, that one? Well, and that's the crazy thing, right? Cause like, like I, you and I were talking about that Liberty game and, and trying to decide. And ultimately I decided to stay with, with BYU because I, I didn't feel like I could pick them three weeks in a row to lose, even though my gut was kind of telling me, hey, you know, look at Liberty here. But the, the reality is, is I just don't see BYU in a good uh, environment right now, right? Like in, in a lot of ways, I see this team as, you know, they, they, they get two 10-win seasons, 10-plus win seasons. They've, they're building momentum. They think that everything's going well. You come back with a lot of returning talent, and you think that you're just going to be able to roll. Well, the reality is, is you're, you're seeing a little bit of what Utah felt those first few years of the Pac-12, right? Utah did okay when they first jumped into the Pac-12, almost won the South Division and got to the championship game. And then slowly those teams started deteriorating, right? Injuries started to stack up. You also started to figure out that the physicality in the Pac-12 on a week-to-week-to-week-to-week basis was at a different, different level. Now, look, BYU is not in the Big 12 yet, and they're going to have an even bigger adjustment coming in next year. But I think that's kind of where you're getting it, right? You're, you're facing tough teams where you have Oregon, Notre Dame. Even though Notre Dame was down this year, they're still a tough team that recruits well, that has those guys. You know, you're, you're getting to these levels where it's difficult, and, and then you just get caught by a Liberty team that, that beat you. The, the thing that, that you know, I, I took away from that more is, you know, coming into those games, everybody was talking about the defense and how frustrated they were and, and the changes that needed to be made and, and everything there, and they were all merited, right? BYU needed to change on defense. They need to figure their, their stuff out. But at the same time, your offense only scored 14 points against Liberty, right? Not everything is working well. You're, you're finding out that Puka Nakua is basically the guy, and that's about it for, for BYU. Last year, it was Tyler Algier, and he did a lot for BYU to be able to kind of mask some of those problems. And that's where they're going to face a lot of these situations, right? They're going to find that they have to have more than just one, maybe two guys that can consistently get chunk yardage or everything that way. You've got to be able to have depth at every single position or else you're going to find these games where even though on paper you should beat a Liberty team, which is a good Liberty team, right? They were 6-1. and one, But you've got to be able to have this week in, week out so that when injuries come or even without the injuries, that you can sustain that blow every single week. So to me, it, I, I'm kind of seeing BYU go through those early years of Utah in the Pac-12 uh, you see those, you know, early five and seven seasons. I don't, I don't necessarily think BYU is in that um, disarray right now, but you know, they they they've got an East Carolina team that's a really good team coming. I think they still have Stanford on their schedule. Yeah, Stanford at the end of the season. Boise State's kind of turned a corner, and and they could be a good team. So, yeah, look, I, I I you know I feel for BYU in the sense that you had everything going the right way for you, and then it suddenly stops, and it's it's a frustrating situation because I think they're a good team. They're just they're kind of 
in their own heads right now and nothing's really working. Uh, yeah, real quickly, yes or no, does Utah, or just, sorry, does BYU make a bold game this season? Ah, man, that's tough. Like, I, honestly, I could see them losing to East Carolina or Boise State or even Stanford for that matter, right? So, I mean, sitting here with two games left to be able to become bowl eligible, I'd like to say yes. Uh, you know, you get that Utah Tech win. If you don't, I mean, there's there's no hope to be able to, to worry about anything. But so I think you've got to win one out of your last four games outside of the or three games since you're counting Utah Tech. I'd, I'd have to say they at least get to six wins. But beyond that, I don't know if it's it's going to be any better. What about you? Yeah, I, 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 can, I, I can see them either beating East Carolina or Boise, but uh, it, it's just crazy how fast the season can unravel if you lose momentum and you see that, um, you know, what was, you know, going well for you is now suddenly a weakness and, you know, you're giving up, you know, 40 points to a Liberty team, 300 yards on the ground. And it's, uh, you know, momentum is a fickle thing and it, you suddenly, you, you lose it and you start overcompensating. You try to do too much and, Solomon pointed out that, you know, Scally's always pointing out, hey, do your 111th. You don't need to, you know, be Superman out there. You don't need to, you know, do more than what we're asking you to do. But here's your box. Make sure that you are assignment sound and doing everything you can because, you know, with as creative as the offenses are becoming in football, they're fun to watch. Um, they're they're going to try to get uh, – basically, they're going to narrow down the game to one matchup. And they're going to have one guy – uh, going up, one of their good, better guys going up against one of the guys that they've circled that you know we want to exploit this matchup. And they're going to come at you, uh, and if they can get it, then usually it's going to be a big play. If you can stop it, then you know then you've got to find a chance. But uh, you now these offensive coordinators are getting awfully creative, and it was fun to watch uh, you know some of these games around the country this weekend, and and not uh, um, you know just just kind of have a, a an observant eye so to speak and just kind of watch football and kick back and not have to worry about the Utah game and uh, enjoy the bye week and so it's fun to from that perspective just to sit back and uh, kick back and watch some of these games um, the, the the other one that real quick I wanted to, uh, to, to touch on was the Utah State Wyoming game didn't go the Aggies way uh, it seems like Utah State's injury report is longer than their active roster at this point they're down to their fourth string quarterback and Bishop Davenport just didn't have the horses to hang with Wyoming and Laramie. That's a tough place to play as well. Um, had some big plays in the run game. Calvin Ty- Tyler uh, was able to keep it close there for a little bit. I mean, it was a six point game and going into the fourth quarter. So Utah state still was, was fighting, but uh, just didn't have the horses um, literally to, to hang with the Wyoming <laughs> Cowboys. Just didn't have the horses. Unintentional pun. I like it. I, I think that one's an interesting one because, you know, B- or BYU, we're not there anymore. Uh, Utah State, you know, you had Cooper Lega, who seemingly started to get that team kind of working in the same uh, momentum, kind of same headspace, get out, got everything going. And it seemed like Utah State had kind of turned a corner. And it's unfortunate that he was able to, or was able, was knocked out of the game um, and wasn't able to play because I think Utah State probably could have won that game, right? Like, Wyoming's a good team. I don't want to say that they're not, but they kept that game close despite really getting pushed around all day on both sides of the ball, but kept it close, found a way to be able to stay engaged in the game. They just didn't have a guy that has honest experience, right? I think Bishop Davenport, last game, not the Wyoming game, but the one before that, those were his first reps that he's ever taken really in college. I think he- Yeah, a true freshman, not like a red shirt. He literally drew a freshman playing his first snaps. And your fourth string, right? Like, you're not getting a lot of snaps. The most snaps you got was in fall camp, but they're not giving you the whole entire playbook. They're not, you know, spending a lot of time working on you. You're there probably to redshirt or just to be able to be a depth guy. And the reality is you're being thrown into a situation that you're just not ready for, right? And and so as, as yeah. much as it is to look at Utah State and say how frustrating they are this season, I think it's just been a comedy of errors in 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 the sense that, they just haven't been able to get everything right on the same uh, on the same page, right? Your injuries with quarterback play, with whatever it may be, and it's unfortunate to see because I, you know I was actually talking to my wife the other day about this. I said, "Remember at the end of the season when all three Utah teams were ranked in the top twenty-five, and now look at it, right? I mean, Utah's been re- you know good, but they haven't been as good as people were expecting, and now you've got BYU and Utah State that have have really struggled." Uh, 
you, fortunately, you have a, a fun Weber State team that's done really well, and outside of four unassisted safeties from their long snapper, could have potentially Snap been seven and zero. Just take a knee at that point. I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> Line up your oh punter like fifty yards behind. Nope. <laughs> I don't Jeez know. Like it's Louise. at that point, you might as well just go for it on fourth down because you're going to get a safety or so, I don't know. It it's sad to yeah. see, but. Well, I mean, what's sad there with, with Jay Hill's Wildcat team is they were in such control of that game. It was like, what, 24 to 9? Yep. I mean, you had everything going for you. And then it was just this comedy of errors that you, I mean, you couldn't take your eyes off of because it was such a train wreck. And unfortunately, Weaver State was on the wrong end of that. <laughs> uh, you, you rarely see, you know, yeah, bad snaps happen, but not four of them. I mean, that was just. <laughs> Those are at like, some point you got to try something else. Like I, you know, there's times when you like watch a sport and you're like, oh, I could do that, and that's usually coming in like curling or something, right? But like, there's there's yeah. times there where I'm like, I think I could legitimately be a better long snapper than what just happened, and and I hate to like trash a kid, right? Like that's tough, but that yeah. it's it, it's tough, right? Like I, whether you're at their FCS level or or an FBS level, I mean, you've got to be able to get a, a snap that's better than that, and and you feel for the kid because that that's a tough environment. And the reality is, is you lost by, you know, the points that you gave up in safeties. So uh, tough environment. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, this week is going to be a fun one. We've got Utah on the road uh, going to Pullman to play Washington state. That one's on Thursday night at eight o'clock. Make sure you get your picks in TV is FS one. Uh, hopefully there's not truck racing before that, or you'll have to stream it on your app for the first quarter. I don't know. I haven't looked at the TV guide yet. I don't want to jinx it, but you hopefully there's look not at the truck TV racing guide? Is right that before. What, is that what we do now? <laughs> is that what you do now? You got the oh, magazine the, the, coming the, the, to you? I, I, yeah, I do. <laughs> do you know? I, you yeah, know, I quite honestly, when I was a kid, I loved that. I loved when the TV guide came and watched what was going to come that week and read the previews. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm a nerd that way. On uh, Friday night, uh, you are there, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Friday night, East Carolina travels to Provo to uh, face a reeling BYU team that's lost three in a row. That one's on ESPN2 at 6 o'clock. And then Saturday, the Saturday slate that we have here for KSL Pickham, number two, Ohio State versus number 13, Penn State in uh, Beaver Stadium. That one should be pretty wild. It, it, as much as these big games, I, I, I don't like the big noon kickoff. It just doesn't do it for me. I, this 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 deserves to be an under the lights seven Agreed. o'clock kick, and it, it's doing a disservice to have it at ten a.m. But it is what it is. Uh, I, I, you know, the early line for me, uh, Ohio State favored by ten plus. I, I think I'm leaning more towards Penn State, maybe not to win, but at least to cover. That's a that's a tough environment to play in, and hot take. And we'll see how uh, Ohio State responds. Yeah, I'm not picking Penn State to win per se, but I think that this game could be closer than a lot of people anticipate. Uh, we'll stick in the big – we'll go to the Big 12 for this next one. Number nine, Oklahoma State versus number 22, Kansas State. Kansas State played tough with TCU just like Oklahoma State did the week before, but a uh, common result, they end up losing. Uh, TCU finds a way to win. Kansas State drops about 10 spots in the rankings. Um, what do you see happening here in Manhattan, Kansas? I think it's going to be a fun game, honestly. I think it's two good teams. I think it's going to be a good battle, and I'm looking forward to see it. And then we're going to the Sun Belt, Coastal Carolina at Marshall. Um, we're trying to get each conference represented at least once in Pickham. We're going to have a tough time with the MAC. Maybe we'll have to do conference championship weekend or something because they play on Tuesday nights. Doesn't really jive with the Pickham schedule, but it is what it is. And uh, we're going to go Sun Belt. Coastal Carolina's good team. Marshall beats uh, Notre Dame in South Bend, so they're they're a pretty good team too. So this one should be a fun one. It's not the same um, Chanticleers that we saw in 2020, but still a good team. <laughs> same quarterback, though, believe it or not. Yeah. Marshall's so, good, though. You know, don't don't sleep on Marshall. Yeah. We are Marshall. We are Marshall. Anyway, get your, get your picks in. Go to KSL.com, sports tab, click on pick them, sign up. You can win some gift cards from Golden West Credit Union. It's fun to have you participate. While you're on the site, you can also submit your top 25 pool. Getting a lot of uh, people submitting their ballots, and it's uh, – and it's doing well on the site. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, with all the work that we put into it, that people are, are enjoying it. So, Yeah, we're having a lot of fun over here. We want to make sure that you have a good experience, that you're able to uh, pick some fun games, that you're able to, to rank the top 25 like, like we're able to do and, and do different things that way. So, you know, come, come back on KSL.com, do all that. We've obviously got all of your coverage for the various sports teams that, that we cover throughout the state. 
Um, and then also we have this podcast and we're, we're grateful that you're listening to, uh, please tell your friends, um, let them know and, and help us uh, spread the word of, of the Utah Checkdown podcast. But we appreciate you, uh, listening to us this time and obviously for Solomon Enos for joining us and we will catch you next time. <laughs>